Welcome to Statistically Insignificant, a podcast about statistics in everyday life with bonus scroll. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she and they. With me is Bart. Hello, Bart. Hi, how's it going? Um, I go by he and him, and I just have to issue a correction from last week. Oh no. Um, I said my dad had 100 first cousins, which is obviously an absurd number. He actually has 148 first cousins. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> That's obviously less absurd, yes. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> I think uh, I think my mother has about 50. <laughs> I have something like 25 or 18. Yeah. I can't remember. Look, yeah, I-, I think I've got about 20. No, how many? For, yeah, some I don't know between sixteen and twenty. Yeah, it's it's a bit of a drastic <laughs> change between the generations. A little bit of a drop, for sure. Yeah. So, but we both live in Australia, although I was imported at an early age. When people are born here in one of the richest countries in the world with a mostly public healthcare system, they expect to live to eighty-two in the general population. But if someone lives to sixty that changes with a total life expectancy of 84 and a half. So that two and a half years difference, why you might expect to live longer at 60 than you did at birth, is one of the things we want to talk about today. Specifically, we'll be talking about some population statistics, life expectancy, infant mortality, and maternal mortality. It's a bit of a morbid episode as a result, so dear listener, consider that a content warning if these topics distress you. These are some of the most common official statistics, by which I mean statistics produced by a government or similar body about a population. But how they are defined and talked about hides some important and relevant information. These sorts of statistics get used to make policy decisions about healthcare, but particularly on the international level about things like uh, aid funding and the like. But we're going to look at a couple of specific cases of use within countries as well. All of these come from a core data set of how old people are when they die. That gets converted to these particular statistics, which are then used to re- represent some aspect of population health and well-being. The main source that I'm going to look at is the UN Stats website, which collates data across a large number of different countries that is released by local governments. It sources from the Australian Bureau of Statistics here, for example. On any individual country, it's not the most up-to-date data set, but the way that the statistics are defined is consistent, and it's reasonable for what we're doing here. If you want to know more about your specific country, you can look at the UN Stats website, go to their sources of data, and see where your government releases that data and have a look at it directly. So let's start with life expectancy. Through UN Stats, there are two numbers given for each country. Life expectancy at birth, and life expectancy at 60, which are further split up by male and female. One day, maybe, we'll have figures for a third gender, but policy websites don't tend to keep up with that sort of thing. The first of these, life expectancy at birth, is the expected number of years a person lives from the time that they were born. Every live birth in a country that gets recorded, anyway, counts towards this. Life expectancy at 60 is how many more years a person is expected to live if they have already made it to 60. Yeah. By live birth, does that not include, um, like, children who die at birth? Yeah, so deaths during... uh, well, stillborn children are not counted towards that statistic. Okay. Yeah. So calculating the life expectancy at 60 does not include anyone who died before they got to that age. So when you look at the number, you need to add it to 60 to get the total number of years that a person is expected to live, which is what I did with our Australia example. So that 84.5 is I had a life expectancy at 60 of uh, 24 and a half years, which I added to 60 to get 84 and a half. Yeah. So to understand why these numbers disagree, and in some cases they disagree by 20 or more years, we need to look at how they're calculated. 
What I'm going to show you is a simplified version of how the proper calculation is done because it has like some fiddly features which we won't get into and aren't necessarily relevant for the overall interesting stuff that I want to talk about. All right, see. We are going to imagine we have a population with five people who died at the following ages. 1, 27, 67, 82, and 88. To calculate the average age of death, the mean age of death, you add up the ages and divide by the number of people. So add these up. Mm -hmm. Divide by the number of people. Which gives us 265 divided by 5, which is 53 years. Yeah. Well, if I could write, it would help. Okay. <laughs> From birth, we would expect a person to live for 53 years. But in our observed deaths, three people, over half, lived more than 10 years and up to like 25 years longer than that, while two died a fair way younger, like 27 and a half that age. Yeah. So this mean is a measure of center that doesn't really well represent what happens at those extremes. It's pulled around by very big or very small numbers in a way that can distort the like lived experience, if you will. Yeah. When you're looking at a large population in particular, so this toy example with five, it's very difficult to kind of wrangle in that respect. But if you've got like thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, things get a little bit more gnarly. This is why it's a bit problematic to say that in medieval times, for example, people were dying before 40. Even if that is the mean age that people lived to, it's skewed by the number of people who died but while they were very young. For example. Yeah, I had heard that. Yeah. So in our case, this poor one-year-old here, they pull the life expectancy down in a way that would not if they had been older when they died. So we can leave that out as a way of kind of talking about adult mortality as opposed to ch adult and child mortality and look at the life expectancy for adults, which would give us 27 plus 67, plus 82, plus 88. Now we've got four people, so we divide that by four. So you get 264 divided by four, which is 66 years. This is a lot more representative of what you would expect if you live to adulthood in an imagined population. It's not a fantastic representation of what happens for older people, but that's what the life expectancy at 60 statistic is for. Yeah. So let's calculate that. First of all, we're going to calculate the total life expectancy. So this will be 67 plus 82 plus 88 divided by 3, which is 237 divided by 3, which is 79. And then we subtract off that's 60 years to get the life expectancy at 60. So these are our two statistics to describe our population. 53 years is our life expectancy at birth, and 19 years is our life expectancy at 60. Yep. The 79, which is kind of the total life expectancy at 60, is like or 26 years longer than the life expectancy at birth. So we have a population where that gap is large. Yes. This is because we have these people dying young. I mean, if one in five of your deaths is under the age of 20 or whatever, that's a huge proportion of the deaths that are happening very, very young. Yeah. And that skews the data quite a, a bit. One of the statistics you get about mortality is your infant and child mortality. And you can use that in combination with your life expectancy to have a look at how the general health of your children is, effectively. Yeah. So now let's talk about mortality. Numbers like infant and maternal mortality are given as rates, which is the number of incidents in some larger number of people in the population. Specifically, we have infant mortality, which is per 1,000 live births. Yeah. And we have maternal mortality, 
which is per 100,000 people giving birth. Yeah. Is that so because, usually it's... Sorry? Is that because the proportions are different between those? Yeah, so more children die than uh, people giving birth. It's okay. worth noting that most of the literature refers to women giving birth. We're not going to do that. Yeah, yeah But if you go and look it up, that's what you'll find. So the first thing to see here is, as you said, this scale is radically different. 1,000 is 100 times smaller than 100,000. So when we look at example numbers, it's really important to keep that in mind. Also, live births are not paired one-to-one -one with people giving birth. There may be multiple babies born at once, twins, triplets, or more. Or the pregnancy could end with a stillborn child who would not be counted as a live birth. Maternal mortality also doesn't just include death during childbirth itself, but all pregnancy-related reasons. I think some of it goes up to a year after birth, but I'm not, I'm not entirely sure about the like, medical details of that. Yeah. Deaths in childhood, so infant is first year. Deaths in childhood, which is usually like up to, uh, under five or under ten, is a slightly different statistic. So if you want to talk about the health of children beyond that first year, you can look at child mortality and mortality under five, both of which include deaths in the first year. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to write this note here, first year. So that unfortunate one-year-old in our example would be counted as an infant for the purpose of this statistic. I was just going to ask with the, um, with the maternal statistics, does it include things that... Uh some people would think of as more tangentially related, like uh, suicides from postnatal depression and things like that. So I think the details are a bit fuzzy, right? I suspect a suicide would probably be counted. Of course, it has to be identified as a suicide and yeah. postnatal depression would be considered. But something like a car crash, probably not. Okay. Let's talk about these in combination. If you have a lot of people dying as children, high infant and child mortality... This will lower the life expectancy at birth because the average number of years people live from birth gets dragged down by the number of people dying very young. Yes. People who make it through childhood in places with that situation may still live to be quite old, which is why you would also look at the life expectancy at 60, which gives us an idea of how old people go. Yeah. This does not tell us what proportion of the population will make it to 60, but what you get out of the combination of metrics is a better picture of the overall situation. One statistic in isolation just doesn't give that to you. Okay. This is also that fundamental misunderstanding about medieval society, right? If you have a life expectancy at birth of 40, which they did, that was basically due to the fact that so many kids were dying. Like, if you had, and this was reasonably common, a family that had five or six surviving children Chances are they had half a dozen more, or at least two or three, children who were stillborn or died during early childhood. Yes. So it was it was horrific, and a lot of the time we forget about this stuff here in rich countries where this does not happen. Yes. We have our metrics. Before we go on to look at some examples, I want to talk a bit about the data collection. These come from government sources who get records of when people die and the cause if it's known. This isn't universal. A lot of places don't have the kind of government infrastructure that is required to keep these records and calculate the statistics reliably. So any source like UN stats need to be taken as a grain of salt that there is incomplete information. Yeah. This is particularly true if you are looking at parts of the world that are in the midst of war or have populations who are outside of bureaucratic coverage. Yes. If you're living in a war zone, working out how many people have died is hard enough, let alone how old they were at the time. So at some point in the future, we may talk about estimating casualties in warfare, but that is a huge topic in its own right. Yeah. Now, examples. We've got another table. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm showing my biases somewhat in the countries that I have here, but I think they are interesting to talk about from an Australian perspective in this particular. Yep. So we're going to talk about Australian general population as opposed to Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders here. So for the Australian general population, the life expectancy at birth is 82. The life expectancy at 60 is 24.8. 
Whereas for the Australian Indigenous population, that is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, mm. life expectancy at birth is 73.5, while life expectancy at 60 is 20.1. So already you can see Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people have overall poorer health outcomes than the general population. Yes. This has been the grounds of projects like Closing the Gap is one that's been... It's an effort that has nominally been in place as government policy for a very, very long time, but because our government is unwilling to actually put the money in to fund it properly, the outcomes are not being achieved the way that they claim they would. Yes. I would also like to note that my data, because UN stats doesn't subdivide populations within a country, the data for this life expectancy for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people come from the ABS directly for a similar time period. Yeah, okay. When it comes to infant and maternal mortality, for the Australian general population, infant mortality is 4 per 1,000, while maternal mortality is 7 per 100,000. While for the Australian Indigenous population, infant mortality is 6 per 1,000, and maternal mortality is 20.2. That is slightly higher. disgraceful. Yeah. It's pretty bad. Uh, these come from... Ooh, Aboriginal Indigenous Health and Welfare, which I think is a government department. Again, similar time periods, but these do not come directly from the UN Stats website. Yeah, okay. So we can see that Aboriginal people who are pregnant do not get the healthcare that they need. A lot of them live in very, very remote places without health infrastructure. And in general, remote Australia has poorer health infrastructure than like urban or suburban areas. Yes, okay. Not okay, that's terrible, but I understand what you mean. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a general problem. Like, even the public healthcare infrastructure in Australia, if you go rural, it gets worse. And that's something that I don't think a lot of people living in the big population centres like Sydney or Brisbane or Melbourne really appreciate is just how bad it can get out there. Yeah. And this is also why coronavirus is such a huge risk for these remote areas because they just don't have the healthcare infrastructure to have like these people who are at higher risk because their health is o overall worse suddenly flooding into intensive care, which may or may not exist. Yeah. All right. Now let's talk about the United States of America. Oh, the good country. Oh, yes, the good country. <laughs> That's right. So wealthiest country on the planet, depending on the metric you measure it by, but has some suboptimal healthcare problems. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Life expectancy at birth in the US is 78.7 years. Life expectancy at 60 is 23.1 years. So this is worse overall than Australia's general population, but marginally better than our indigenous population. Yeah. Our final country of comparison is Afghanistan. Their life expectancy at birth is 49.3 years. The life expectancy at 60 is 14.3 years. As you say, as a war zone, those statistics might not be 100%. Either. They're not going to count everyone. Yeah. But at the same time, the people that they do count, the, these numbers are more likely to be better than the reality than worse. Yeah. Because the people who are missing are people who have probably died younger yes. than they would otherwise be counted as, right? This is already really quite bad like you don't I, I, this is a similar situation to um if you will medieval case in that your life expectancy at birth doesn't even hit 60 it doesn't even hit 50 but you do still have over a decade you expect to live if you do make it to 60 yeah. now let's talk about mortality so in the US infant mortality is 6 per thousand in Afghanistan it's 125 which is horrific. Yes, awful. <laughs> yeah. Maternal mortality in the US is 21 per 100,000. In Afghanistan, it's 460. Oh. Yeah. What is interesting here is that the USA, the healthcare system in the US is showing up in these mortality statistics because you have pretty good healthcare for infants in the US. There has been a huge focus on like infant mortality there for a long time, but maternal mortality is not the focus. And in fact, 
there has been a policy push as a result of like various exposés on this and a series that ProPublica, for example, was releasing to say, what the hell is going on with our maternal health care? Why are all these people dying, particularly in childbirth, but around childbirth as well, when this isn't the case in comparable countries like Australia or the UK or whatever? Yeah. There is some push in the US to change that because they, they have the healthcare infrastructure nominally to do it. It's just that the care isn't being provided. Yeah. It's, uh... And Afghanistan is... Well, it's a poor, war-torn country with a almost, in many places, non-existent healthcare system. Yeah. And this is what you see as a result. Hopefully in the future, that can be improved for them, but who knows? I mean, certainly if people keep invading Afghanistan and blowing it up, it's not going to get any better in a hurry. Yes. It's, uh, as I always <laughs> kept, like to try and say, never think that we go there to improve people's lives. Never believe them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, given that uh, the Australian government has just rejected a whole bunch of visa applications from the Afghans who were guarding our embassy because they're not considered eligible, uh, it's some bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing to notice on a purely statistical level is that that really high infant mortality will drag down your life expectancy at birth, but so will the maternal mortality. Because the people who are giving birth are generally younger. They're certainly not likely to be 60 years old when they do. Yes. So, but, but the other factor in there has to be that it is a war zone, right? So you were likely to oh, die, yeah, absolutely. die young as a result of that as well. Yes, particularly if you have like bombs dropped on wedding parties, yeah. for example. So there, there are all of these sources of death that go that factor into these calculations. But you can certainly see from a purely statistical, pedantic sort of standpoint where those numbers get shifted around and why they may or may not represent the actual health of the population if you look at just one in isolation. Yes. With that bit of morbidity out of the way, we're going to move on to our 2B mailbag segment. Because this rec was recorded before we released any episodes, we don't actually have a mailbag yet. So I've picked something I've had questions about from friends over the past year. It is unfortunately also morbid which is excess deaths due to the COVID pandemic. This is distinct from deaths due to the infection itself. Deaths due to the infection are those which are officially attributed to the virus, but there are other things going on during a pandemic that may cause more or less people to die. Like, if your hospital system fails, people who need a set, like emergency care for other things may or may not get it and are more likely to die as a result. Oh, okay. We saw with a lot of countries reporting, particularly early on in the pandemic, that there are all kinds of incentives against attributing deaths to an infectious disease during a pandemic, particularly if your government has made suboptimal choices around its efforts to combat the spread of the disease. And we also have like all this other stuff going on, like the hospital system being overloaded, or if you have societal collapse because so much of your population has died that you can't have critical infrastructure running, other stuff is going to go wrong and people are going to get sick and potentially die as a result. Yeah. Estimating excess deaths is one way to quantify the impact of a disaster like a pandemic, which looks beyond just the number of people whose deaths were attributed to the disease. The shortcoming is that it doesn't take into account non-lethal impacts. So this does not calculate, for example, people who are going to live with long-term disabilities as a result of COVID. Yes. There is never a single statistic which will neatly summarize a crisis, but this is not a bad one in the sense that it gives a bigger picture than just the COVID-attributed deaths. So the basic idea here is that you compare the number of deaths that were recorded to what you expect to have seen based on previous years. There are various different ways of doing this which give you different information. To start with, you need an estimate of what you expect to see. Yeah. Typically, a week-to-week -week average of the number of deaths over the last five years, which can be adjusted for population size as well. We're going to show a plot of this, and then we're going to talk about the calculations. So if we have our y-axis and our x-axis, so this will be time, yep. and this will be deaths. 
So if we put our average here in black, say it looks something like this, because you usually expect to have some sort of seasonal behavior. Yep. And then for a given year, so this is uh, average over last five years. And then we look at the actual number of deaths observed week to week. So I'm not going to put every point in here, but you can imagine maybe it goes do this in red so it stands out more. Maybe it goes up because you've had a COVID spike, then you start managing it, then it drops below what you expect to see because other diseases aren't getting through if you're locked down for a pandemic. Yeah. Maybe you unlock and it goes up again and so on, you know, that sort of thing. So you can measure the difference between these points and that will give you an idea of the excess death. So the excess deaths include COVID deaths as well. That's what I was... Yeah, okay, yes. cool. This is the the total number of actual people who died, assuming you've measured them all, compared to the number of people you expect to see. Yeah, okay. So you calculate it. Actual minus expected. Yeah. Notice, if you have a good year or a good period of time, this can be a negative number. So in here, for example, that would be a negative number of excess deaths because you had below what you expected to yeah. see. It has not been a good year for a lot of countries. Once you have this number for each week, you can add up the result over the time period you're interested in to get a total number of excess deaths. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples. Here is Australia from, well, this uh, black line here. Yep. This is the average, would you expect to see? This is 2020, yep. and this purple line which starts here is this year, 2021. Oh, okay, yeah. So as you can see, Australia has had more than the average number over the start of the year. We haven't got, uh, this is slightly older data, this is only up to April, but you can see last year in June, and during the middle of the year, we actually had fewer. So in here, this red line, this is the observed number of deaths, which is below what we expect to see based on 2015 to 2019. Yeah. So during that period, the excess deaths would have been negative. Yes. You also notice that in general, you have this periodic behavior where you've got this massive spike around August. This is basically the flu season. Yeah. From the Australian Bureau of Statistics, Australia has had... 387 excess deaths over 2020. So that's basically um, this tail end here and this period here is what came to yep. that. Let's compare this to the United States. Oh boy, it's not a happy plot, right? So you can see that for the entire time period, basically the uh, pandemic started roughly yep. here. You see this spike, which was the first wave. Uh, you had second wave and you had third wave. So it dropped off. So this is the start of 2021. Yeah. It dropped off a lot when people were locking down and vaccines were getting distributed. But it's still higher than average for the previous years, as we can see yes. here. Over 2020, this is not including the 2021, so it's not including this spike up this end. The US had... 300,000, 380,000, sorry, and 96 excess deaths, according to the CDC. My God. It's pretty big. And it doesn't, it's not the total number of people who died due to the pandemic itself either, because that doesn't count all the people who died at the start of yeah. this year. The other thing to notice about this statistic, these are absolute numbers of deaths. This does not take into account population size. So Australia, with its 25 million people, you would still expect to see a smaller number of excess deaths, even if we had a proportional amount of damage, compared to the US with its 330 million yeah. people, roughly, I think. So what you need to do to get around that is you need a statistic which doesn't depend on the population size. And we call this a p-score, which is not the same as a p-value. <laughs> so this gives excess deaths... as a proportion or as a percentage of 
of of expected. Percentage. Yeah, percentage of expected. Okay. What you do for this, your p-score is your actual minus your expected. So that was your um that was the excess death statistic we have yep. above. And then you divide by the expected. This will give you a proportion, and then you multiply it by 100 to get a yeah. percentage. So a p-score of 10 means you had 10% more deaths for the time period than you expected. A p-score of minus 10 is 10% less. Okay, yeah. So you can do similar things. You can show this week to week. Here we have Mongolia, Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States, and this does not depend on population size, so you can compare across different countries how well they did or did not do effectively. Yeah. Right. At least in this, num- in at least in these terms. In, yeah. in this number, yeah, yeah. And oh boy, can we see <laughs> that the UK stuffed it up, right? <laughs> in, in general, like the UK's response to coronavirus has been pretty shocking. Yeah. And the healthcare system over there is not... It's doing better than the healthcare system in the US because people don't go bankrupt when they use it, but it's still not good. Relative to their population, it just ran rampant, particularly through old people, and that has that has some serious problems yeah. with it, right? Well, you yeah, you have to consider the 10 years of austerity specifically directed at the NHS before... The, uh... Yes, and the efforts to privatise yeah. it and everything. We can compare here, we see that the UK did in fact suppress deaths after that point. They've come back up a bit here, just as um, this was the Christmas second wave that the UK had. The US has been trucking along pretty consistently above what they expected to see. I put Mongolia here for two reasons. One is that they've actually managed to do surprisingly well. I say surprisingly from a Western perspective in the sense that we did not expect Mongolia to respond to this like strongly. But at the same time, they dealt with SARS yeah. back when SARS was a thing. And their response to an outbreak in China was basically to say, OK, we've got a lockdown. We need to get our healthcare system up and running properly. We need to support people and help them get yeah. through this. And the other reason is that you can see that the dots here are less frequent on Mongolia's data than they are on the other two. So this is because Mongolia, it looks like it releases month to month as opposed to every week. So you have more sparse data from Mongolia than you get from Australia, US and UK. Um, I was going to ask, because it's calculated around expectations of death, could it be kind of hiding a little bit... um, if a place was already kind of trending towards crisis before it comes up, if you know what I mean? Oh, yes. Uh, so this is the weakness of using an average of previous yeah. years. It's it's difficult to measure the impact of crisis when something kind of becomes a shock to the system and causes a cascade of failures, yeah. right? And this is stuff we've observed in the US. Like, you have knock-on effects from the huge number of people dying, which overloads the hospital system, which draws in resources from elsewhere. So just this week, we've seen, I can't remember exactly where it was, I think it was in Florida somewhere, people were asked to reduce their uh, use of tap water because oxygen that is used to purify and um, treat water was being diverted to hospitals because they were running low. Yeah, that's so That's an infrastructure (laughs) problem (laughs) <laughs> it's very, very grim. But you, you see all of these kind of overlapping problems that make each individual one worse. Climate change is going to be a tour de force yes, of this. Of We're already seeing it happen, but it's going to get worse in that yeah. respect. One last note on this. You can't add up these percentages to get the same overall number that you did previously because they represent like a time period percentage per time period and if you just add them up you'll quickly go beyond 100 percent. so the easiest way to calculate the uh percentage the p-score for a time period is to uh get the total excess deaths
divide that by the total expected total death. Expected death. Yeah. And then multiply that by 100. For the US, the excess deaths in 2020 was 380,096. 380, but I'm going to show you the raw numbers that go into calculate this uh, P score for that over time. In 2020, the US saw 3,440,640. Well, yeah. There's a zero in there. 640 deaths. It expected to see 3,060,544 deaths. And we divide that by this expected number 3,060,544. So that gives us. Oh, and uh, 44. Then we multiply that by 100. So that gives us a 12.4% P-score, right? Yep. This is US. Which is 12.5% more deaths than you expected to see over 2020. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Which is not not great. No! <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> not as... Not, I mean, look, it's not as bad as it could have been. And some of the uh, estimates out of India that I've seen is because their ability to do record keeping during this disaster has been severely affected their official deaths were something like 300 400 thousand but the actual number of people who died based on the rate of crematorium use for example could be an order of magnitude higher than that so yeah. in the millions it's pretty bad and we may never actually know exactly how many people have died over there certainly it's very very difficult to count that. <laughs> it's great isn't it and the most the most devastating thing to me is it it didn't have to be that way between Modi's willful incompetence and also like them getting absolutely screwed over by the West who refused to let them locally produce vaccines for distribution. They could have saved so many lives and yes, they didn't. It is, um... <laughs> it's depressing. Like if there was any justice, right? If there was a functioning justice system, this would be a crime against humanity. Oh, absolutely. But there is not. Anyway, so we're going to look at Australia for comparison. So, because I'm running out of room, I've got to write this down here. So, Australia had 153,303 observed, minus 152,916 expected deaths, divided by 152,916 times 100, which is equal to 0.25%. So realistically, Australia's actual number of deaths didn't change yes. a hell of a lot. This did not take into account the current Delta uh, variant outbreaks we're having at the moment because this was last year, but we did shockingly yes. well. Because we locked down, we had systems in place to help people. We had a healthcare system which didn't fall over with the number of people yeah. flowing into it. And that makes a huge difference. You can almost see it as, as a shock as like a demonstrating demonstration of the capacity of the state to function. Yeah, well, in Australia, we still believe that the state has yes. a purpose, uh, despite the best efforts of the Liberal Party. Well, that's everything I've got for us today. If you, dear listener, would like us to talk about a particular statistic that you've seen in the wild or some sort of chart, send it to us on email, statisticallyinsignificantpod at protonmail.ch, or you can DM us on Twitter or on YouTube. Thank you very much, Bart. Thank you. And I'll talk to you later. Speak to you then.